I'm up here at Coil Kilns with my best bud, Michelle Collier. Yes. And Michelle Collier is, works with paper clay. She's going to show us how to do paper clay and how to make these beautiful uh, abstracted uh, figurative sculpture. Okay, ready to go? Okay. So this, uh, this is paper clay. And it fires to cone 10. And it is um, clay like any other clay that you handle, except that instead of grout, it has a little bit of paper. And you can actually see it when you tear the piece. You can see the little, little hair standing up. And that's what makes it magic. That's what allows it to here, adhere to itself, either wet, dry, I've even fired pieces that are already fired and then I can add something and fire them again. It's unheard of. Um, I discovered this clay oh, about 10 years ago, I guess. Some a teacher of mine suggested it and it made such great sense. She was a Raku artist and for her, it meant that the clay was much more uh, stable when you take it out of the kiln and into the, into the smoke much less possibility of what cracking, what things I like about this, and I don't know if you can get this, but that because it has so much structural integrity, you can stretch it out and make it open up. And that's important for me. My pieces, as I finish them, uh, I don't use glaze, I use stains and oxides. And what I want is for this color to catch into these little um, cracks that I've made in the clay and uh, make it look uh, as if I haven't touched the surface. I'm touching the, the heck out of it on the back side, but I try to keep my fingers off the front. If I need to touch it, I'll use a rib or a tool or something other than the standard you know, working it from the outside, I work from the back. Now the second magic about this process are my armature socks full of rice and you can, you can pound them into a shape and you may or may not see that this is a reclining figure. You'll see it as I start putting clay onto these socks. The socks hold the slab while it goes to leather hard. And then I turn it over and I pull the socks out and I have a completely open piece. Like this, all my work is completely open. Makes it uh, lighter. And I like the abstract quality of what happens in the places where it's not completely defined. I like that a little bit of uh, looseness that I find the paper clay so easy to work with. There's, there's, there's no kneading this clay. Comes out of the bag, number one tool. The, the biggest pastry uh, roller you can handle. There are bigger ones than this, but this is the biggest one that I'm comfortable with. And then I'm planning on my very first piece of clay there. I'm preparing the piece by opening it up and and you may not be able to tell yet, but that's her hip. And I just keep working this way with slabs and because it's paper clay it will cling to itself you don't have to slip it or score it you can just work um, in a very free free sense always looking at the edges, you know, I, I like this little curve that happened. 
So I'm going to say, okay, that's her, the end of her. Do I want that? And letting things happen, always a good thing. Whatever happens, it, it makes kind of an immediacy, immediacy about the work. So the other thing is, when it's not working, you throw it back and do it again. I always caution my students, don't, don't try to save something. If it's not working, roll a new piece. So now we're back to square one with the hip. And I want that, that second piece. And I want it to just grab there. I can reach under, you know, and shape things that way. I can cut a piece. It's, um, I've, <laughs> I've told some of my women students, it's like dressmaking. You've got a piece, you know, and if you want to tear it, you know, make a, make a pleat, make a change, uh, because of the paper in there, it's very malleable. Now we're going to put her other leg on. She's starting to look a little more human. We hope so. So this is right at her pubic bone. So the next piece is going to be her belly. Always a fun piece because that's where all the movement takes place. Our, um, our bodies can only swivel and bend around the, um, the backbone. So this is where you get stretch and squeeze. So the side stretches out and this side squeezes in. Again, picking it up is not a problem. Reaching inside, pushing. This is the way the whole thing goes. And um, we're probably not gonna have time to follow this all the way, but I wanted to show you. I usually make hands and faces ahead of time. So that by the time I get there, I can see what size I'm going to use. And by the time I bring the shoulder up, I can just push that face into the neck, which I wouldn't be able to do if this were wet. This needs to be leather hard before. Um, this is my most classic finish. It took me a while to figure it out because this is iron oxide and normally it doesn't get this brown at cone five. It's a cone 10 clay, paper clay. But if I take it to cone 10, this arm is just gonna, you know, by the time I take it out of the kiln, she's gonna be doing push-ups. So I learned by accident, actually, that at the, uh, before the bisque, if I undercoat with a pale green, and then when I put the oxide on for the cone five firing, I get this lovely dark brown, depending on the thickness of the oxide when I put it on. And then I come back with a little bit of oil paint, very thin, and let it run down and kind of catch in all those little cracks and crevices and define the the uh, detail. So that's that's it. Iron oxide with an undercoat of some kind of green.